Good morning, Your Honors. I may please the court. Uh, Mark Karamanica along with Greg Thomas for appellant Michael Barfield, um, urging reversal of the trial court's order uh, dismissing Mr. Barfield's public records complaint. Um, this appeal is not about I whether. <coughs> confirm, because I, I was expecting Verena Nesser or Betsy Young to show up for this oral argument. Have you, have you folks filed a notice of appearance in this? Case? Yes, Your Honor. We filed a notice of appearance. Okay. This appeal is not about whether or not Mr. Barfield is ultimately entitled to the records that are in dispute here. It's not about whether purely private emails are subject to disclosure under the public records law. And it's not about whether Mr. Turner, as a sitting city, uh, city of Sarasota commissioner, has a right to engage in private political activity. What we're here on appeal uh, today for is only whether Mr. Barfield's well-pled complaint um, should have been dismissed out of hand where the trial court resolved factual issues that were in dispute as to the private nature of these records uh, without taking any evidence and essentially taking Mr. Turner's conclusory word on a motion to dismiss that the records that are being withheld are in fact private records. Uh, we believe we've adequately pled the connection uh, to public and official business that meets the statutory definition of a public record here and I'll go through that in a moment but what I want to step back and talk about is the procedural standard and all the inferences that are to in order to Mr. Barfield's uh, benefit at this stage. We're limited to the four corners of the complaint and all those allegations are supposed to be taken as true along with the exhibits that are attached. All inferences are supposed to be um, resolved in favor of Mr. Barfield. <clears throat> We're not supposed to resolve factual disputes and the question is whether a claim could appear on the face of the on the face of the complaint whether a claim could possibly go forward here it's not about whether mr barfield will ultimately be successful now you compound that with the presumptions that favor a requester under the public records law in that we promote broad disclosure we have a constitutional right of access and all doubts uh, as to whether a record is public or private are to be resolved in favor of the requester we have everything that resolves in favor of Mr. Barfield at this stage, but yet the complaint was dismissed out of hand. Um, the complaint, well, let's, let's go back and just talk about the facts a little bit. At all times, as we've alleged in the complaint, Mr. Turner was an acting city of Sarasota commissioner. He, in 2010, was involved in an initiative to restructure power in the city of Sarasota government uh, he did this by proposing going to the uh, Charter Review Committee to propose some changes to the city charter. That proposal failed. Roughly two years later, and in his official capacity, as we've alleged, he tries to get these same changes made through a different vehicle, by going the citizen's petition route. And, and let me stop you right there. I, I, the paragraph 14 does allege that he did these things in his capacity as a city commissioner. Correct. But isn't it the law that even a city commissioner can uh, participate in this charter amendment by petition process as a, as, a, as a politician, as a private person in a way that doesn't in invoke the right to, to review the emails as public record documents? Well, that, that's essentially the core of the dispute in that Mr. Turner has made that this assertion that these I was wearing my private citizen's hat right. when I was you know engaging in these activities but at some point along the line he was a public official that was engaged in, in, in uh, official city business in 2010 then at some point he's he's decided he's gone underground he's wearing two hats wearing two hats and then later on he reemerges and via the partial production that he's made in this um, uh, situation yeah, right. The complaint alleges a partial production. Is this a partial production of emails that include emails from his private account as compared to his All, all of these were on his private account. Okay. Um, and that's, that's um, part of the issue here, too, is that you know, there's this sort of presumption uh, that's, that's being made that because this was all done on my private um, email that there's this, this veneer or presumption of, of privacy that, that in order that these aren't public records. But the public records law is agnostic as to format um, like that, and we know that it's content that controls. And the Supreme Court is clear on that in Chevin v. v. Byron Harless. They say content controls it's whether or not it meets the statutory definition of a public record. Um, 
and that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. And precursor documents that um, come before any time of the, the city commission here took official action um, when the petition was discussed by the city commission, those documents can be public records if they otherwise meet the definition. And I think we've, we've pled the chain, we've pled the connection, um, we've shown um, in, the, in the complaint on at least five different occasions the city commission which Mr. Turner sat on and, and knew that if this petition was, going, was successful, it would be before the commission that he sits on. We pled in five different instances and attached the minutes uh, for those meetings where uh, the, the city commission discussed this particular measure. Now, they argue that those, I'm gonna call after the fact events, don't give you any right to email before those events were going to take place. Well. The, that's not the law. The public records law says you have to look at the content of the emails and, and apply the definition. Um, and precursor records can, can be as much of a public record as any record that um, occurs after official action is taken. If that were the law, then no records would be public records up and until the point that a commission or some you know, collegial body or, or governing body takes official action. And we know that that's simply not the law. Um, so we've alleged how it, how it got to the um, city and, and, and how it's connected with official action. And we've also alleged how, through the partial production, that Mr. Turner was orchestrating the uh, activities of the citizens group to get this back before the board. And I can just um, read a couple of paragraphs from the complaint. Paragraph 28, in addition, the partial production of public records included emails that indicated defendant Turner organized other presentations to the city commission related to the proposed charter amendment petition to the city commission that were delivered by other amendment supporters. Paragraph 31, in another email message from the partial production of public records, defendant Turner indicated that he would send some material about the proposed charter amendment petition to one of the supporters from his official city email account, but warned the individual about responding to that account. This all sort of generally raises the specter of evasion and keeping this off government email accounts. And all we're asking for today is the right to let the evidentiary record develop, let's, let's let the alternative writ issue and have them show cause. We're not foreclosing any argument that Mr. Turner wants to make that these are, public rec uh, these are private records and let the factual record develop. As the case law makes clear, um, the, uh, the case, um, the Clay County Board of Education Association versus the Clay County School Board, which is cited in the briefing, um, they cite a second DCA opinion that was written um, by uh, Judge Silverman and uh, Judge Northcutt, you concurred in this opinion. This is a 2005 opinion, Radford v. Brock. And that was a situation where a requester made a public records request to a, a clerk. The clerk responded and said, I don't have those records. I'm not the custodian of those records. A, manda a mandamus petition was filed and the, dis uh, the trial court dismissed the mandamus petition. This court reversed and said, if, it, if the complaint is facially sufficient, the alternative writ needs to issue. And if the custodian wants to come back and refute and raise a factual issue uh, in responding to the alternative writ, the, we can let that go forward and let the evidence develop. And then a trial court can make a ruling. And what's notable about that decision too is that this, this very court said, we're not, we're, we're skeptical. We're not convinced that the petitioner will ultimately succeed here, but we need to let the process move forward and let this develop and let it be decided on actual record evidence. That's what we're asking for here. We have no record evidence here. All we have are the allegations in, in our complaint, which are to be taken as true, and we're limited to those allegations, and Mr. Turner's response via a motion to dismiss saying that these records are private. That's not enough, and it flips the presumption um, for access to public records. If this, is, if this is the case, then the public records law is essentially eviscerated because all a public official has to do is say, well, I was wearing my private citizen's hat on that day when I made those records and you don't get to see them. And the public is left out in the cold because we can't plead anything more than what we've pled um, without knowing what the substance of the records that are being withheld are. We've pled the connection and we've pled all the attendant facts that support that connection but if we're, if we're required to plead what actually occurred 
via um, what's found in those records, we're out of luck every time, and so is every other requester. So I think we've pled it, and it's important to note, uh, when Mr. Turner was first named in this complaint, and that was in the second amending complaint, um, we were on a motion to dismiss, and the court essentially said, well, you didn't, you didn't plead exactly that these were made in connection with official business. You said they related to official business. Essentially, you didn't track the statute. Well, when we amended the complaint, we did, and then there be those same allegations, along with the attendant facts, are being attacked as conclusory. So that's as far as we can get, and we've, those are not conclusory facts. Those are ultimate facts. Uh, a conclusory fact would be to say, for example, that A murdered B. But a, an ultimate fact would be that A deliberately and intentionally killed B without legal justification. And the attendant facts would say, A, on December 5th, lied in wait at 10 p.m. in the bushes and jumped out when he saw B, pulled out his gun and shot him. We've, we've alleged the, ult, the ultimate facts and the attendant facts, and I think we've set that out. And again, all we're asking for is that the alternative writ issue and uh, discovery <laughs> takes place, and we let this case go forward, and we have a resolution that's on developed facts. Um, if the court doesn't have any more questions, I will reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Five minutes for rebuttal. Ms. Mello. Good morning. May it please the court. Ken Mello, along with my partner, Chris Torres, from Greenberg Traulig, representing Terry Turner in this proceeding. Um, there are no factual disputes here uh, that... There, there can't be. You're on a motion to dismiss it, the pleading. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which is why I'm leading with that point, which is one of the primary points that counsel has made. There's no factual disputes here that require a remand for an evidentiary hearing. The reason this complaint was dismissed below, and properly so, was because there were insufficient allegations that these records were public records I under the, the act. That troubles me most is that the allegations say that some, but not all, of the of the personal email were actually produced prior to the complaint. And so there is a concession by your side that at least some things inside the personal file are in fact public records. And if that's the case, hearkening back to Reagan and trusting but verifying, why is it this gets dismissed on the pleadings as compared to after a little bit of production and maybe having someone do an in-camera inspection of these things to confirm that in fact that he's gotten every, each and every one of them that is a public record has been given and the ones that aren't have been preserved. Right now we're just trusting him that, that he did this accurately. Well, isn't that a problem? No, it's not. Um, first of all, the allegations are still insufficient. And what occurred with the partial production is that the city made the determination that once this petition was submitted to the supervisor of, ele of elections, um, the number of required signatures were verified and it was actually submitted to the commission, which occurred on July 13th, okay, that, that, was, the, that was the date. Um, the records that were produced started on July 14th. So what records were withheld? How do I know that, by the way? It's in the record. He, did he plead it? No, but it is in the record. Those were all attached to a response. But we're, we're here on a granting of a your motion to dismiss a pleading. I understand, but I'm, I'm just, that's what the record reflects. I understand so you're, what you're the standard is. you're going beyond the pleadings to justify the affirmance. Not to justify the affirmance, to explain to, to the court. I think she's answering your yeah, questions I'm, about, I'm, yeah. about the prior. Right. I'm trying to just explain what actually happened below, and that's, that's in the record. I mean, getting back to the actual allegations in the complaint, um, allegations are, are wholly insufficient. Their entire argument ignores what the Public Records Act requires. Your and client's position is <clears throat> that until a matter is submitted for consideration by the body, then it cannot be a transaction or a record in connection with uh, official business. Is that correct? That's correct. Here, he was he was clearly acting as so a, a as a commissioner who 
says to a constituent or to a non-constituent interested party, here's what you have to do to make sure I get to vote on this. Here are the steps you have to follow. Those in your client's position would not be in connection with the transaction of official business. Well, I mean, in that, in that hypothetical, if I understood it correctly, your hypothetical involves his discussions with his constituents. That's, that's an entirely or different... Non, I, or non-constituents. <coughs> an out-of-state out -state organization, a PAC that's interested in a particular issue that uh, your client is interested in. And he says, you know, we don't have anything pending. I don't know if this will ever come to us. But I'd really like to see this issue come before the commission. And here's what you need to do so I can vote on it. Is it your client's position that that is not uh, within the penumbra of a public records request? It, it's not. And the reason it's not is because what the act requires, it, it requires that the record itself be made or received in connection with official agency business. And the allegations in the complaint show that's not what that's not what this case is about. The records that they want, so in connection with the transaction of official business, is only if something is already scheduled to come before the commission. That's what you seem to be arguing. Absolutely. The, what what he was doing was he was involved in a citizens' initiative to bring something before him that he could vote on. That was, yes, it was a group of private citizens. It was, he has a right under the law to engage in private political but, activity. But paragraph 14 alleges that he did it in his capacity as a city commissioner. It does, but that's, that's wholly conclusory. I mean, and we know it's clear from the law uh, that when, what, when what you're- What more were they supposed to say factually to explain that it was in his capacity as a city commissioner? I think there's a, I think there's a lot more that they could have alleged factually that they did not. For instance, okay, they could have alleged that the, and the reason they, they didn't allege it is because it wouldn't be true. But what well, they could be true have. true because they haven't seen the documents. And so no, they don't know no, that that's, I'm true. sorry, Your Honor, but that, that's. Well, that why don't is, you go back to what you just started? Tell us what they okay. should have alleged okay. that would have been enough. Okay, for instance, they could have alleged that there was some connection between a citizen's initiative led by the Citizens for Better Sarasota and official agency, and official agency business. There was no such allegation. They could have alleged that he was somehow controlled or influenced by the city to participate in the citizens' initiative. They could, have, they could have alleged that he was directed to do it by the city. They could have alleged that it was part of his official responsibilities. The reason there are no such allegations is because they can't plead them because he was engaging in private political activity. And if you look at the city of Hallandale case, that's exactly what happened there. So paragraph 22 talks about his efforts to move this issue forward before the commission in his capacity as a commissioner in terms of the preparation of an ordinance and so forth. Why is it not a fair allegation to say he couldn't get it done one way, but now he wants to do it another way to bring something before him to vote on in his official capacity? Perhaps that w that is what he was doing. I mean, he couldn't get it done one way. That's what is... But to me, both pleaded and at least a reasonable inference in terms of what's pleaded, here's how, here's what we're trying to prove, and here's the discovery or the public records we're entitled to get to see if we, in fact, have a violation of either his oath of office or is there bribery, or is he doing something because he's got a friend who's pushing it, who's a big contributor. I mean, isn't that what the public records request in connection with the transaction of business is designed to ferret out. It's certainly not designed to engage in intruding into somebody's right to engage in personal political activity. Are there any and that's cases, what you uh, have if he were involved in private political activity, for example, I want to support Sheriff Smith or I want to support candidate Smith to become the next sheriff, that perhaps is unrelated to his transaction of business for the commission, as opposed to what is happening here, which is an issue that is specifically designed to come before his commission so he can vote on it. Right, but his personal, <coughs> but the test is that his personal, his emails have to be records prepared or made in connection with official city business. 
There's the NCCA, NCAA case, for instance. Yes. Sure. What so troubles me is that you've conceded that some of the emails for some period of time in this private account fit into this category. And I fully understand your argument that he's a politician, he's entitled to be a politician, and that's not a public record thing. And therefore, it may be that 100%, I mean, it may be that he has been completely accurate on his breakdown of this. But, you know, it's not as if he used a neutral person to sort through them and decide which were political and which were public. And so I'm struggling with the black box they have to deal with, why these aren't allegations, at least enough to have somebody independent double check to see if there aren't at least a handful more that maybe fit into one category as to the other. Well, I mean, our position would be that because he was engaging in private political activity up until the time that this was submitted to the commission and all those records were produced, the records that were subject to production were already produced. And even if I accept that, how do I know that's true? Other than he tells me that. By the date. And I know that all of the records after that date have been produced. I mean, there's nothing in the record that would show that he was withholding something deliberately. How do you make that distinction based on the allegations in the complaint? Well, to the extent that you're wondering whether an in-camera inspection, which is, I think, perhaps what is really troubling you, why there's no in-camera inspection. What harm is there in going through the in-camera inspection to have a judge confirm this? Because your client hasn't even answered and denied anything. He hasn't answered. I mean, I don't think there's harm. I just don't think they're entitled to it by law. And they're not entitled to it because they never stated a claim. They never showed that. They never made any allegations showing the requisite connection. I mean, there's nothing there. All of their allegations, okay, they go through an entire litany after this was submitted. They talk about how when it came before the commission, it was debated, there were amendments, there were – none of that matters. Well, it matters in the sense that your client knows when he's engaging in the earlier political part that if he's successful in the earlier political part, that this is going to become a very public matter. That's true. But that would be true of anyone, regardless of the county city commissioner. That would be true of any private individuals exchanging emails. But that doesn't make those emails connected to the public. Absolutely. That's my point exactly, and that's the problem with this complaint. As long as he very carefully divides these two points. Because as soon as he sends an email a week before the hearing coming up to somebody on the staff of one of the other city commissioners saying, you know, this is going to be coming up for consideration, I hope you take a good look at it, even though it's before this date, that's going to be a public record, right? He can't do that as a politician. He's got to do that if he's communicating with somebody else in government. That's a public record. Isn't it? Probably yes, it is. And so how do I know? Why isn't this complaint enough to at least let us look for that one email? For all the reasons that I've previously stated, you've got to make the requisite connection, and it was not made here to obtain records for his private political activities. There's just nothing in this complaint to demonstrate that. And so I understand why the court may be troubled, but it's not our burden to plead. What is the best case you have that would support the idea that you're suggesting, which is an issue that he is trying to bring before his body, that there is a line of demarcation before it is teed up before the body versus not yet teed up? I mean, I think that there's a couple of cases. Again, the city of Hallandale case, which I've already discussed, which deals with the mayor's personal emails attaching articles that she had written regarding city business on a personal computer. 
In that case, what the requester wanted was actually the list of recipients. The court found there because there was no, and, and, and it, Judge, this, this was clearly a different procedural context. I don't believe this wasn't a motion to dismiss, but it's still instructive because it's instructive because it shows that what the courts look at is whether there's the connection, and here and there the, was the, no connection. Okay, what's um, the best site you have of a case that was dismissed on a motion to dismiss on this theory? On, <laughs> on these facts, I mean, I, I can't. On, I mean, any it. public records case that's kind of like this, that's got that the dismissal is on, uh, on the pleadings because they haven't invoked the Public Records Act. I mean, there's a number of cases that. See, I mean, most of the cases that I'm thinking of right now, I, I mean, are not in that same procedural context. But I, I know that a number of cases that they cited, in their own papers that dealt with dismissal. There is a clear distinction in those cases. And the clear distinction in those cases was those records were, that were being requested were clearly, clearly public, public records. There was a case dealing <laughs> with um, an appraisal um, for um, a lot that the city had purchased. There was a case dealing with some litigation files. There was a case dealing with, with school board, um, the operations of a school board, and all those cases they were all looking at the motion to dismiss phase, okay? And in all those cases, they said, you know what? They've said enough. But here, they've got to say more. They just absolutely have to say more. The, and, and, and because it, it, this, is, this is not, I mean, look, there's well, a, there's you know, a clear a way, spectrum. In a way, what you're, saying, what you're saying is, is that the request, as phrased, was way overbroad. Okay, because if they didn't say, you know, it says all emails sent or received by you on your personal email account that relate to the proposed petition initiative to amend the Sarasota City Charter. You're saying that statement in and of itself does not reflect or restrict the request to official documents created uh, as part of the right, city. And, and that's, right, and that's part, that's part of the problem. And in particular, the and second and one was related to the financing of the proposed petition initiative. Well, obviously, the city had nothing to do with the financing of the proposed. Right. I mean, and, and, and that's so part of the problem. The council and the city had nothing to do with the financing of the, of the petition. Right, and I mean, part of the problem here, and that's why, I mean, the city, in an abundance of caution, they did the partial production. I mean, they got this overly broad request. They wanted to be as responsive as, as possible, so they made the decision to produce the records from the date that it was submitted forward. Whether or not, in retrospect, that was the right decision, because the it's creating some city confusion. Or Mr. Barfield, uh, Mr. Turner, who did this? Pardon me. Was it Mr. Turner or the city that did this request? I'm confused. Well, he was at that time a city commissioner. Okay. And I believe, okay, and, and I, I don't think this is in the record, but you're asking the <laughs> question. But I believe that the, it, these records were actually produced by the city. Because at some, he was apparently added late to this lawsuit, if I got the facts right. Yes, he, would, he, was, he was added to the lawsuit um, in the but Second Amendment let me, complaint. Let me go back to Judge Northcutt's question. If, if the initial request to produce is overly broad, it, is, your, is your client supposed to take the, to respond and say it's overly broad, do you need to narrow it, or I, I don't quite know what they're supposed to do in that situation? I, I'm not sure either. All I know is what was done here. And, and what was done here was they tried to respond in an abundance of caution. They tried to be as inclusive as possible um, in their response, but, but I mean, that just at this point, we can't change that. That's what occurred, but that doesn't mean that <clears throat> we somehow don't have the right now, you know, to say that these allegations are wholly insufficient, and they were. They, they were for the reasons that I've expressed. I mean, they essentially want you to rewrite this statute, and I know in the city of Clearwater case, it was, that was your precise concern in that case, which eventually went up to the Florida Supreme Court and was affirmed. I mean, they want you to rewrite this statute to say that it can be a record made or prepared in connection with private political activities, in connection private with a citizen. Private political activity that will come before <coughs> you vote on. Sure. But, 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 it, but, but, but it's, there's still no connection to the official agency right. business. Right, so like all emails sent or received by you on your personal email account that relate 
to the proposed petition initiative. It could be an email between him and his wife talking about. It, 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 it could, could absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I mean, th this was clearly, he was involved with the citizens for a better Sarasota that were advocating for a change in the structure of the city government. Just because he's a city commissioner, his involvement with this private group does not necessarily turn his communications within that group into public a record. Absolutely not, not under the existing right. statutory so, definition. Right, and of course this, this request as stated, as stated, would have included those communications. Well, it was deliberately broad because that's right. clearly what they were seeking. That's what they were looking for. I mean, that's for. what they really wanted. But legally, does that make this a complaint not to state a cause of action for something that might fit into the public record? You can, but you have to have sufficient allegations. Because you didn't move to dismiss it on grounds that the request was overly broad and couldn't be complied with and was all of these. Yeah, but we did not. That's sort of a response to discovery, it's over broad as opposed to. That, precisely. We didn't get to discovery here because it got dismissed on the pleas. Because the allegations were, they were insufficient. They were not, they were, they were not sufficient to show a connection to a public record. I mean, when you're requesting a, a public official's personal email, when he's engaging in private political activity, which the, which the cases clearly show are protected, you can't just get up there and, and, and say, oh, he was engaging in a citizen's initiative. And you know, he thought this might eventually come before the board. And you know what? It did. How does that show that these records were made or prepared in connection with official agency business? If this was an appraisal and they, he had just simply said, we want this appraisal. The city purchased this land and used all the fancy buzzwords from the statute. Maybe in that case, it is enough. Of course, agency, agency is defined to include the individual, correct? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. And so in this case, the individual was not named. It was not named. And it does include the individual. So it doesn't have to be formal business then occurring by the body. It can be his effort as an individual on the body to push an issue. Sure. And we really can't determine that without potentially an in-camera inspection as to what was in the contents of those emails. I, I really, I, I understand your concern, but, and I feel like I keep repeating myself and I apologize, but I just have to keep getting back to the point that you first, you have a threshold here and that threshold, that's their burden. That's their, they have the pleading burden. And so you're saying a proposed petition initiative to amend, okay, a proposed petition initiative to amend the charter is not the business of the agency. Absolutely not. And that's clear from the Sarasota charter. All you have to do is look at the Sarasota charter. Two ways, two ways to amend it. A completed petition sufficiently signed and submitted becomes the business of the agency. Absolutely. Because then it's before the commission. Before that, it's just the actions of private citizens. Okay. That's a critical distinction. We're, we're running way over at this point, so I'll let you sit down. All right. Thanks. I would request based on the reasons I've stated that this court affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I think counsel made the point. We don't know what happened. We don't know what decisions Mr. Turner made in determining. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the thing is, is that you could say, we want to see your private email account because there might be some official agency business emails in there. And you, I don't think you can kind of go fishing like that, can you? Your Honor, I think. Through every, every office holder's email account. Your Honor, if our request said to the, something to the effect of our, our, our petition here said, we have a belief that you might be conducting private, uh, public business on private email accounts. So we want to audit your, your private email accounts. That, that would be something, a step too far, but here we, we, we've limited it. Let's take it a little closer. You have an issue and that you want everything that relates to that issue, whether it came before the city council or not, or city commission or not. So it include emails with his wife, includes emails with, inside the organization. Okay. And, and I think what you're getting at is, is essentially the issues that need to be resolved by applying the public records law, because 
there may well be emails that he withheld that meet, otherwise meet the definition of public records. If, they, if there are communications between him and his wife, uh, but to that use your example. True, that would be true if you just said, well, he uses, a, he uses a private email account. I have the right to see everything that's in there to be sure, or, or to have uh, a, a judge go through his private email account to be sure that he's not conducting any public business there. Right, well, and, and Mr. Turner, th this is a, a situation of his own doing. Um, he took an oath when he became city commissioner to abide by the, the Constitution and to, I mean, to abide by the public thing. records law. And to the extent he is conducting, which he, he clearly has admitted, at least in part, he's conducting public business on his private email address and the attendant facts that we've pled that show that this is all related to a, a, a matter that's coming before the very said, commission that he said, sits on. If you said in your request any, any emails in his private email account that occurred uh, after the submission of the petition, obviously that would be, you know, well, that, that's Mr. Turner's interpretation of the public records law, no, apparently, and that's a non-event. I'm reading your, you want anything that relates to a proposed petition We're, to amend the city charter. We, we made a public records request related to this petition, and, and to the extent that if, if the evidence bears out that there are some records that don't meet the definition of a public record and they are private records, we understand that. We're not saying, we're not trying to fish through every last email. But you are making a request, you are demanding, I mean, you have to live by the scope of your demand, do you not? And you're demanding every email that relates to a proposed petition. Because as the facts- And, and you're conceding, I think, to me that some of the items within that request might not be public records. It, it's impossible in the universe of records that he's withheld, but we don't know that. And to to just yeah, walk but, back. Yeah, but you, were, you were requiring him because you were going to ask for attorney's fees, right? Because if he, if he didn't produce every email that relates. I mean, I don't think you can just go in and say, I want everything, and he doesn't give you everything. He gives you what he thinks are public records. And now, you know, but now I want everything, you know, I want everything. I mean, I think you have to, I think your burden is to, uh, as Ms. Mello was saying, is to plead a proper public records request, not plead access to any repository where there might be public records. Well, Your Honor, respectfully, I, I believe we've, we've made that um, so request. So every email and he sent on his private email account related to a proposed public petition, you think is a public record? I, I think with the way that they're, they're describing their methodology for the response, which- uh, I'm reading your, I don't even want you to go to them. I'm looking at the allegations of your complaint, of, it, your, of your public records request. I think the public records law does require that because it would be no different than any other public records request that a custodian has to respond to where it's voluminous and it takes time to go through and piece uh, out. We're not talking about voluminous. We're talking about whether these are public, whether your request uh, is limited to public records. It, it, we're requesting the public records to the extent that it's, it's construed as, as being beyond that, then they, they have a right to assert those exemptions that may apply or that it's not a public record, but uh, we have a right well to test your, that. Your position is, as, as I understand it, and contrast it to the other side, is when you ask for records that relate to the proposed petition initiative, it's based on your interpretation that in the connection with the transaction of official business by any agency, that would include the lead up to an issue actually being submitted to that agency, to that commission. Yes, Your Honor. The, the, the supervisor of elections certifying that the signatures were valid and this can move forward, that, that is a non-event in terms of whether or not the, the, these records are public records. And just to, to walk well, back. It doesn't become any business of the city commission. Does it? Whether people are out gathering signatures. It's not none of the city commission's business until they actually get the signatures they need and present the petition to the commission. But we have, we have pled how Mr. Turner had orchestrated this this petition so drive what? and and so and pled what? the connection. Politician. Politicians orchestrate things all the time. I've watched the news. <laughs> They're doing it all the time. They talk freely about it. But that's still private political activity. That is not official agency business, is it? 
Well, we, we, we contend that Mr. Turner has put himself in a very unique position here by virtue of, of engage. This isn't political activity where we're saying, we want to learn about all your involvement with the NRA or a right to life organization. No, you want to learn about all your involvement with the with group who wanted to administer the trust? So they kind of, kind of the same thing. With, that relates to the, his official duties and how he was well, trying to do this. The NRA, the NRA wanted to amend the city charter to, to uh, address the Second Amendment or whatever, you know, and, and so that's fair game. All of his private emails are fair game. The, the premise that they're private emails, is, I think, is the problem. Where, where I think your response is yes, to the extent it's an issue that he's going to ultimately be asked to vote on. Yes. Yes, and uh, the final point I want to I mean, make. I think that I think I'm, I might not agree with Judge Silverman about the scope of this what is public records law, but I think his advice to you is correct because that's the only way you could adjust. Yes. To justify yeah. the breadth of this document request. Yes. Okay. And to the extent the request is overly broad, is there any case that says that it's fail it's a failure to state a cause of action as opposed to the court reviewing what is asked for and determining based on what the documents contain what is subject to production that that would be the preferred method is to okay is well to then let me ask you this excuse me excuse me let, let, let uh, him answer uh, let, him, let him answer the question then you ask your uh, question okay <coughs> um in cases where there is a dispute say it's an exemption or the, there's a dispute as to whether or not it qualifies as a public record we don't just dismiss the case out of hand. We develop a factual record, and we, we an in-camera review might be part of that. And the cases that are cited, the Hallandale case, if you walk that case back to the trial court, you look at the trial court's final judgment, and that was on a motion for summary judgment, and, that, and there was evidence taken, and there was, and the, the final judgment indicates that discovery was, was ongoing between the parties. So there was, a, there was an evidentiary record to base these decisions on. But you could, you know, what you're saying though, is when I look at the breadth of the re document request, which is how, what your suit has to be based on, right? You have, to, you have to make the request, and then you have to sue and say the request has been denied. You could go to any politician and say, we want to, if, if they have a private email account, we want to see everything in the private email account. This is going to be your request that relates to any matter that eventually came before your board. That is the connection. That's what we've pledged, and, and we believe that's. Do they would have to submit to that. That is their burden when they take their oath. Uh, and we have a constitutional provision that, re that requires access, and this is, this is the situation of, of Mr. Turner's own doing. you don't have to any actual agency connection to it. You say you're a politician. We've pled the connection to the bringing it back to his board, and we, we believe we've adequately pled that. And again, to, to dismiss this out of hand at the motion to dismiss stage, we think is premature, and we're just asking for an opportunity to let the alternative rate issue and let the evidence develop. Well, no, I think what he has to say, though, is, is the question is, is, was your public records request, not your pleading of it, but was your public records request valid? If it was not, this gets dismissed. You can't say your, your pleading is too broad. Your public records request was kind of set in stone when you made it. Well, we contend that it was a valid public right. record. Request. So that's where you're at. Not, you know, let's see what complies with it and what doesn't in your lawsuit. So, now how is the financing at all related to anything having to do with the city commission? The financing, that, that relates to how, how this matter was, was put through and how what, it got it, to the what board. What business and of it was that the city commission, how it was financed? Is it may well be. We, we just don't understand what was going on between uh, mi uh, Mr. Turner and, and the, uh, the citizens' petition, and to the extent that, that it, it uh, involves going back to the city commission saying, here's what I can do to, to get this, go, uh, to, to move this along and take it back to the commission, uh, to the extent finances and, and the way this is funded bear upon that. Um, those are public records. But again, we're just asking for the opportunity to, to have our day in court on this and not just reject out of hand that M Mr. Turner simply says they're private and we don't get to go forward. That just cuts against everything the public records law is, is here to you know, uh, protect against. We're, we're well over time again, so you need to wrap it up. Right, thank you, Your Honor, okay. and we re respectfully urge reversal. All right, we'll take a break about 10 minutes, and when we come back, we'll pick up the Rauschenberg Foundation versus the trustees.